Welcome to Counting with Python's Counter. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course is all about Python's Counter class in the Collections Library. You'll learn about counting problems in computing, how to use the Counter class to write less code, practical algorithms where the Counter class is helpful, and multisets. Sample code in this course was tested with Python 3.10. The Counter class is mostly unchanged. I do use f strings in a couple of places, but besides that, the information is fairly version agnostic. A common problem in computing is determining the frequency of items in a sequence, or to put it more simply, counting things or groups of things. If you're counting one thing, you use a variable, but if you're trying to count a whole bunch of things or track multiple things, then Python's counter class can help you do that. The first lesson will be on counting problems. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll introduce you to solving counting problems without Python's counter class, doing it the hard way first. My mother would be proud. Computing is full of counting problems. One of the first things you learn to do with a sequence, such as a list, is to find its length. That's a basic counting problem. How many things are there in that sequence? Finding the length of a sequence is only the beginning, though. What about grouping things together in your data? Counting these kinds of things is called determining the frequency of an occurrence. Let's go to the REPL, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let me start without using any libraries, just some straight Python data types. Take the word Mississippi. What if you wanted to count the occurrences of each of the letters in the word? You could create a dictionary. Then for each letter in the word, check if that letter is already in your dictionary. If it isn't, then create and initialize the key value pair to zero. And then either way, increment the counting value. Looking at the result in the dictionary, you'll see a key for each unique letter and the corresponding count of the letter as the value. One M, four I's, four S's, and two P's. By the time you're done, you're going to be tired of Mississippi, I promise. Initializing a new key in the dictionary can be done in other ways. Let's skin the proverbial cat. What a horrid expression. Same initial dict. Same for loop. And this time, instead of a conditional to initialize the value and a line increment, it can be done in a single statement. The get method of a dictionary takes a default value parameter. So in this case, either the letter is fetched and then incremented, or zero is returned and incremented. The new value is set into the dictionary at the corresponding key. The counter dict now has the same result as before. And you could also do it with the default dict class. Default dict is a specialty dictionary class that lives in the collections module. And this time, instead of creating an empty dict, you create a new default dict class passing in int. The hint here is in the class's name. It is a dictionary with a default value. Passing an int means that if a key isn't found, create it, setting it to an integer. The default value for an integer is zero, so our new key will be set to zero. As before, same loop. And this time, a much easier to read line. This is doing the same thing as get before, but by using the default dict, the default's key behavior sets it to zero, and then you can increment it. Looking at the counter, you see that it looks a little different as the result isn't a plain old dictionary, but a default one. The counts inside are the same, and as default dict inherits from dict, anything you can do with the base class, you can do with this fancier one. Okay, I think you've got a taste for the problem. As this course is titled Counting with Python's Counter, it shouldn't be a surprise that the next lesson is on using the counter class. 
In the previous lesson, I showed you a counting problem and tooled a solution by hand. In this lesson, I'll show you how to use Python's counter class to make this simpler. The counter class is a member of the collections library, and like several of the other classes within that library, it is based on a dictionary. In this case, the keys are the instances of things being counted, while the corresponding values are the count of those things. You came here to code. Let's dive into the REPL. Think back to the Mississippi letter counting problem in the previous lesson. Here is a much shorter version. Yep, that's it. Creating a counter object results in counting whatever iterable is passed in. A string in an iterable context gives each letter inside of the string. So passing a string to counter counts each of the unique letters. Counters can also take lists. Passing in the list in this case, the list is turning the string into the iterable of letters, and passing the list into counter ends up in the same result. You can also pass in dictionaries. In this case, the key value pairs indicate objects being counted and their corresponding counts. Essentially, the data structure our results got stored in back when a variety of cats were in danger. All right, I'll stop with the cat jokes, I promise. You can also pass in named arguments to counter. Each named argument is treated as a string with the corresponding value being the count. Alternatively, you can give it a set. Remember that sets are also constructed based on iteration, but they can only hold one instance of each thing in the iteration. Creating a set from Mississippi iterates on the letters, keeping only the unique values. Create a counter based on the set results in a count of one for each of the letters. Counters are just dictionaries. You can use any hashable item as a key and store any value. The only caveat is that if the value is not an integer, you won't be able to increment that count later. So although it won't stop you from storing anything, if you want to take advantage of some of the key additional features of counter, you really only want to store integers. Let me show you another example using arguments. Here, I'm storing integers, and one of them is negative. What does minus 15 tomatoes mean? Well, maybe you owe your neighbor that many and this counter is tracking what's in your fridge. You know how a second ago I mentioned you can increment the counter later? Well, it's later. Little deja vu. And one Mississippi. And now with the counter instance, I can change values by calling the update method. Like the initializer, update takes any iterable. Iterating on Ohio adds two O's, an H, and an I to the count. You can see the difference here. You can also call update with a dictionary. That's a lot of I's. Notice updating with minus five H's leaves minus four H's in the counter. You're probably starting to see the pattern here. You can update with arguments. That's five more S's and five more P's. As a counter is just a special type of dictionary, you can access a key with a subscript, which means you can loop over your counter. Likewise, counters have a keys method so that you can get at the keys in your counter. And a values method. and an items method.
all your inherited dictionary goodness. One behavior of counters that's a little different than dictionaries is when you ask for a key that isn't there. Instead of getting a key error, you get the count. There are zero A's in Mississippi. Well, Mississippi plus a bunch of other things I did, but there's no A's there. Note that this is case sensitive. Nothing I've typed has a capital letter in it. So asking for one is going to return zero. Another service the counter offers is information on how common the elements in the container are. Consider a counter tracking how many pieces of fruit got sold. The most common method returns a list of tuples. The tuples are the key value pairs in the counter, and the list is in order of frequency. Apples are most common, tomatoes the least. You can pass an argument to most common to limit how many items come back. This is just the most popular type of fruit. And that is the two most popular. Passing in none is the same as no argument. You get back the whole list. Passing in a number bigger than the number of items in the container returns the whole list as well. What about the least common items? Well, there's no method for that, but you can get at it with a bit of work. I'll start by capturing the most common. Remember that this returns a list. And then I call the reverse method on that list. Voila, you've got it all backwards, as intended. There's more than one way to... Oh, wait, I made a promise. Anyhow, uh, you can also call the built-in function reversed. This gives you a list reverse iterator, which you can put in a for loop or do whatever else you normally do with an iterator. I'm just going to stick it in the list so you can see the results. One last way to accomplish the same thing. This is slightly harder to read, but a fairly common shortcut. It's called the negative slice. This is a trick that works with the slicing operator to create a reversed list in place. See the description below for an article with more details on this. Now you've seen how to use the class, next up I'll show you some practical applications.